So we have a number of new people this week, but because the morning session is uh, rather compressed, we'll do introductions in the afternoon. Uh, just one comment for the new speaker, new, new, new participants, which is that speakers are, in, people who ask questions are encouraged to wait for a microphone. There are four of them uh, because the questions are an important part of the discussion. Bill Unruh pointed out, argued that due to information loss, uh, his seminar that he gave 37 years ago introducing unradiation is unreconstructable. And uh, we may not believe that, but a simpler way to reconstruct your remarks is if you record them. Um, anyway, today I think we have a concerted attack on the firewall, uh, one after another, beginning with Suvrat. Because, okay, so at 12 we have to break sharply so that we can all go get, get lunch before Lenny's blackboard lunch. Uh, so uh, we'll let the speakers control, control questions a bit. Um, in the afternoon we have a long period for discussion in which we can revisit all these issues. So, Sufran. Okay, is, is, is the mic on? Okay, okay, thank, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, I was going to do a Blackboard talk, but this is a, a computer talk because of the tight schedule that was imposed on us. So, so uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, work based on this paper with Kiriakos Papadimos and mostly also about some work in progress. Uh, unfortunately, my collaborator, who was supposed to be here to give a joint talk with me, uh, couldn't make it at the last minute. So I'm just going to do, uh, do his share as well. Uh, let me just start by uh, talking, giving you a brief overview of what I'm going to say. Um, uh, and I, I'll talk by very quickly reviewing our construction uh, from last year of local operators outside the black hole and, and behind the horizon. And uh, these, this construction of local operators is, is state dependent in a way that I'll describe at length. And it gives, you, gives us some picture of complementarity. But then I'm going to spend a lot of my talk uh, basically addressing various counter arguments against the existence of these operators in the CFT that describe the interior of the black hole. Uh, so there are many counter arguments that have been made. For example, there's this counter argument that you, know, you make a measurement outside and that screws up the experience of the infalling observer, which I think can be phrased in terms of commutators, which I'll address. And then there were these uh, other arguments that EMPSS made about, you know, how operators inside should have a left inverse, which they, which they can't because they map states of higher energy to states of lower energy. There's a more recent argument by Marolf and Pulchinski. Uh, there's an argument that even in principle such a construction couldn't exist by, by Mathur. And then there's an argument about why the vacuum is frozen uh, by Busso and Van Ramstrong. So I'll try and address all these counter arguments. I think we have, we have good answers to all of them, but I'll spend most of my talk talking about that after a quick review. Okay. So let me just very quickly review, review this construction, which you're probably mostly familiar with. Uh, so you know, a very general property of, of the boundary of, of the, you know, the kinds of uh, field theories that appear in ADS-CFT is that they have generalized free fields. So these are operators which are you know, just light operators, which have the property that if you look at their correlation functions, you look at an endpoint correlation function, this correlation function factorizes into products of two-point functions. Now this is a property that free fields have, free field correlators factorize, uh, but these guys don't obey an equation of motion. And of course, even this two-point function is fixed by conformal invariance. The i epsilons here tell you how to pick up a certain phase. This is the phase for the Whiteman function. Uh, but these are correlation functions that have this property. So the stress tensor, for example, has this property that its correlators factorize at large n. The stress tensor itself you know, doesn't obey a separate equation of motion. It's conserved, of course, but doesn't, you know, um, and, uh, or the trace of s squared. And uh, so the point about this construction of local operators is to recast the dynamics of O. So I should emphasize that the philosophy in a lot of what I'm saying is that you can take the correlation functions of these boundary operators and you can recast them into correlation functions. You can just make an integral transform of these CFT operators into some other CFT operators uh, so that these CFT operators really behave like free fields in that they obey an equation of motion. They're not generalized free fields. They're correlators factorized, and they obey an equation of motion. And the price you have to pay for this is that you have to introduce an extra dimension. Okay? So uh, this, is, this is the philosophy I'm going to try and take throughout this talk, in that you have certain correlation functions in the CFT. The CFT is, 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 you know, is our defining theory. It's the CFT is what tells us what's happening. And it might be convenient to recast the dynamics and the physics of these correlators in terms of auxiliary fields that live in the bulk, in terms of some other bulk, uh, bulk observables. Okay, so that, that, that's going to be the philosophy. And as I said, there's some integral transforms you can find explicitly that in the vacuum, these mode functions depend on whether you're the vacuum or not, 
uh, recast the dynamics of these generalized free fields into those of free fields. Good. Now I think that, that this is, this is uh, I think that this is one of the clearest ways to understand the emergence of the bulk from the boundary. You know, it is, uh, you have a boundary, you have a set of correlators, and there's a, almost a unique recasting of those correlators into correlators that live in one higher dimension, into, into correlators of perturbative fields. And I want to say that this map works, and in hindsight, sometimes when people look at this map, they say, oh, that's obvious, you know, of course something like this should have worked. But I want to emphasize that, you know, if you didn't know about ADS-CFT, if you were trying to construct this map based on what we knew about conformal field theories, you know, 20 years ago, uh, then, uh, you know, this map would look completely miraculous. And an example of this kind of thing is that, you know, that, you know, the bulk theory doesn't have any normalizable solutions for space-like momenta on the boundary. And there's an analog of this statement in the boundary, which is that space-like modes of a generalized free field just decouple at leading order in 1 by n. So there's something that's required in order for this map to be consistent, even at infinite n, forgetting about 1 by n corrections. You know, it couldn't, you can't take generalized free fields on the boundary and, and, and uh, in, in the vacuum and take those correlators and recast them into correlators of perturbative fields propagating in a Schwarzschild shell space time. And you can't just do whatever you like. So there's something which is constraining about this map, and we would like to argue, in fact, that once you include one by n corrections, that basically uniquely fixes this map. But this is a constrained map. Good. Uh, now you can also do this uh, in terms of a black hole. You can also do this uh, for, for uh, you can also do the same map. Uh, and I'm going to talk about always being in pure states. I don't want to be in some ensemble of states or in a density matrix. So let's say you take the CFT in a pure state, a pure state with a lot of energy, some energy of order n squared, and so that this pure state is close to being a thermal state. Now most pure states at this energy, if you, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you take a genetic enough state, are close to being the thermal state, as, as many people in Santa Barbara have told us, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So any, you know, even uh, exact energy state might look like a thermal state. Now these same uh, free fields that I talked about previously, the stress tensor, say trace of S squared, they have different correlators when you expand them in this state. Okay? And you could ask, how does this happen? You know, you said there was some 1 over n expansion and everything was two-point functions. The reason it happens is that you have to resum the 1 over n expansion because the external states have energy as of order n squared. Okay? So the basic two-point functions change and they become the thermal two-point functions. Nevertheless, you can still construct perturbative local fields. You take the same Heisenberg operators, you convolve them with slightly different functions, which you can compute explicitly. And you get some other uh, operators that live in the bulk, but that now know about the geometry of the ADS Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, for big, or, or if you like, a big black brain living in ADS, this is in momentum space. Okay? So these, these, these already these operators that live in the bulk know about the geometry, and that depends on this function. And this function is, as I said, are quite constrained. Uh, it's even more constrained uh, than it was in in the in the uh, vacuum case. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know. Uh, there were, and, and sometimes still are, papers that say, oh, you can't do this bulk to boundary mapping uh, whenever you have a, a big black hole. You know, this is not possible. And in fact, there's some recently also some papers that, in my opinion, are incorrect. And one of the reasons this, this mapping works and one of, is, that, is that, you know, again, boundary correlators have some very specific behavior. So by this, I mean if you take a correlator of this kind, uh, an operator of this kind, and you take it to have large space-like momentum so that the mod of k is much larger than omega, you can't ignore it completely, but if you insert such an operator in the middle of a correlator in a thermal state, uh, this kind of correlator is suppressed. It's suppressed by a very particular coefficient. It's suppressed by e to the minus beta k over 4. This is something you can prove based just on general properties of conformal field theory thermal correlators. Okay? And it's this kind of suppression that is a key ingredient in allowing this map to exist even in a thermal state. And I can explain more if you would like to hear about you know, what are the various constraints we have in this map. But the point is that this is a constrained map, and it's a non-trivial map. Okay, it's some, it's some non-trivial map, and uh, the claim is that the CFT correlators really know about the geometry. And just from the CFT correlators, if you were to try and self-consistently construct some perturbative fields, you would basically end up reconstructing the geometry. Okay? So this is a review, a very quick review of uh, this construction of local operators. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, I'll be happy to take them, because from now on I'll talk about uh, newer and maybe more controversial stuff. Uh, 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 anything about this line? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, you, you didn't read the last bullet point. Should I, can I ask you a question about that? No, the... I, I said everything about this. Oh, about the, I'm, I'm going to now talk about the last bullet point. I'm sorry, I'm too okay. eager. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, good. So now, now, now let me talk about, talk about the, the, the last bullet point, which is that this, this map, as you can already see, is state dependent. 
Okay, it's it state dependent because you know this kernel that I was using to convolve my just outside the black hole. I haven't talked about the interior of the black hole yet. This kernel that I was using to convolve you know these Heisenberg operators in the boundary, what integral transform I was making depended on the state. Right? It wasn't. It was a different integral transform in the vacuum, and it was a different integral transform in the state of very high energy. And in some sense, uh, let, let, me, let me go on to the next slide, and then, then I, 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 you can <laughs> just, just give me one, one minute more, one more slide. Okay, and, and in some sense, you expect that this should happen, because you don't expect to be able to formulate a sense of local observables in some background independent way. When you talk about local observables, they're local observables that are described in terms of a background geometry. Okay, so you have to know something about the state in order to be able to formulate these local observables. I'm going to ask you all to wait for one minute, because I have one more slide about this, and then I will. I will okay. OK, now I want to say that this is not a modification of quantum mechanics. I, I, I thought I might have anticipated some of your questions, which is why. Uh, it's not a modification of quantum mechanics. Okay? It's not the statement that you know, these operators are always linear operators. It's just that what integral transform you make to the CFT operators, the same Heisenberg operators, you make different integral transforms to these operators to get a convenient description of the system. And what the convenient variables to describe the system is, what those variables are depends on which state you're in. Okay? So it's, it's not that, that I'm saying that this is some operator that doesn't act linearly. It's always, you always have these linear operators, but just which operators you choose to describe the system with depend on you know, what, what the state is. So somebody asked me the other day, you know, what if I take a Schrodinger cat state? I take the vacuum, and I take the state of energy n squared, and I take a superposition of them. And uh, then what, what will you do? What, what does the operator do? The point is both the operators, you know, this phi vacuum, which was a CFT operator that I defined for this state, and this guy are both well defined, but neither of these operators has a good interpretation as, as, as a bulk perturbative field. So these operators are well defined, they just don't have a good interpretation. What if I take some other combination of these guys? You know, I take some linear combination of states with, with a given energy. If these, if these coefficients have the right kind of properties, then again, you might be able to ascribe some temperature to this kind of a linear combination. And then this kind of operator, but not the vacuum integral transform, would have a good bulk uh, interpretation. Now, sometimes you know, people want to impose a super selection rule. And they want to say, well, energy is not state dependence, but everything else is state dependence. Now, actually, at finite end, this understanding of super selection is not at least what the usual understanding of super selection is. At finite end, it's hard to introduce some super selection sector that says, oh, you can't have a coherent uh, uh, you know, uh, superpositions of states with energy 0 and energy n squared. You probably should be able to in the CFT. But nevertheless, even leaving that aside, this kernel depends on more than the energy. Okay, for example, if I take some, some gas, some gas of gravitons with a lot of energy that is going to collapse into a black hole, and I do this bulk to boundary mapping in this geometry, this kernel is different before you form the black hole geometry. You should be able to describe this entire process in the CFT, and it's different after you form the black hole geometry. So this map knows more than just you know, the details of the energy, and it's, it's something. So it is state dependent, but it's state dependent just in this way in that you use different integral transforms. And it's not just dependent on the energy, it knows about more. OK, please. So yeah, I wanted to raise this now because this is the first appearance Fine. of the word state dependent yes. in your talk. And everything you said is non-controversial and well known. Yes. I just want to, but, but again, OK, except, <laughs> except well, actually Don is much worse. He'll help. Okay, but, okay um, so I'll pass him the microphone in a second. But I just want to, everything you said is, I mean, it's a, your operators are your 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 operators are maps from states to states, yes. and you will never use state dependence. You're saying for a map from states to states, which depends on some other state that's specified first. That depends on some other state that's specified first. Um, I think I won't. You yes. won't. Yes, I won't. I, I won't on some other state. This on some reference state. No, I didn't understand. You, What's you, the you, yeah, that, that is before the operator is even known, you have to give us reference state. Some many, I mean, that's the problem. That's, no, I mean, that's the criticism of of, of state maybe dependence. Maybe towards the end, when I talk about the frozen vacuum, uh, we can ask. This, you can ask this again. Very I'm not very sure if I understand your question, but I'm going to say something that sounds suspicious. Okay, because what because you said, and maybe, maybe you can ask. I think your question. constructions are not state dependent in the harmless sense you've just described. In this sense, I, I just described. This is this is okay. So I, I am going to talk about a more drastic version of state dependence. You're right. This is yes, but yes, go on. All right. But this you agree with? This you're happy with? This kind of state dependence? Yeah, we said no, I, I agree you said this. Okay, no, no, but this you're, this you're happy with. Okay, good. Yeah, except for the terminology, we're happy with this. Okay. I, my only, uh, my, my criticism is you seem to imply that in principle this is the best one should be able to do. I mean, I have no problem with the idea okay. that it is convenient to use different transforms in different situations okay. and so forth, okay. but it seems to me that in principle there should be an operator in the bulk that corresponds to something like 
what value of the scalar field would an observer measure if they jumped in from this point on the boundary and then waited 10 seconds of proper time? I mean, maybe you would have to, you'd have to, without making any reference to, this would be some state independent, some background independent uh, yeah. definition of it's quantum gravity. It's horribly complicated. It's hard to write in terms of the CFT, impractical for calculations, except in certain approximations where it coincides. I mean, something. how do you even label these bulk points? I don't understand. This is labeled by some, no, maybe, the, maybe you could do it. The maybe. operator I described is Was one labeled by a boundary point and an amount of proper time along, you know, some world line following in. As a simple example, you could have ones that are actually maybe. easier to define quantum mechanically, but more complicated for me to give you a paragraph of text describing. May, may, maybe. Maybe you could define such things. I mean, these operators we actually know how to find, whether you can have some, you know, background independent operators. Maybe you could, we can discuss it more. But, I mean, they're not going to be so relevant uh, uh, to the story. And I, this is certainly the best we know how to do in any explicit way. If you had something like this, that would contradict a lot of standard intuition, at least, about the locality uh, being defined only about a background geometry. Well, I'm just maybe you can define, maybe you can talk about, you know, you can label space times in some totally background independent way and define these operators. Let me ask you a question. Here. My question is, is it important to your story, is the idea that one cannot do better than this important to your story? Or no. is it merely a technical difference? No, I, I, I mean, I, if you could do better than this, that would be great. I, I, great. This, is, this is what we know how to do, and, and this is what I will talk about. But if you can do better than this, that would be great. Fine. And, and everything you say, is the, are you distinguishing in any way the interior of a black hole? So from far, I haven't talked about the interior. Whatever. I okay. will talk about it now. Okay. okay, good. So now let me talk about the interior of the black hole. So now the thing about the interior of the black hole is that, you know, you can't just take these operators outside. Just from the bulk intuition, you can't take these operators outside and reconstruct the interior from them. And the reason for that is simple. One way to explain it, and I can explain in more detail if you'd like to know, is that you know, there is operators inside, and you have, you, know, you have some left movers inside that you can analytically continue across the horizon. But behind the horizon, there are some additional degrees of freedom. One way to think of these degrees of freedom is that they're the degrees of freedom that would have come from the other side, from the other CFT, okay, from the other side if there had been an eternal black hole. Now, there is no other side in this case, because we are talking about a Schwarzschild black hole. But the point is that there are two different kinds of modes behind the horizon. So if, you if you'd like to think of it, there are right movers and left movers outside the horizon. The left movers are those that continue smoothly past the horizon. But then you have some independent right moving degrees of freedom that live behind the horizon. And those are some just independent you know, degrees of freedom that look like they would have come from the other side. No question. Yeah. Sorry, just, just to clarify yes. that. Now you're talking about degrees of freedom that are not all available to excite among the naturally formed states of the system. So yes. there could be right moving modes that are formed dynamically in yes, ways so the, we know and also ways modes, that I'm going we to talk don't. a lot about what these yeah. Otilda modes are. Okay. So but, but there's a there's an important distinction I think to make between you know whether you're talking about independently exciting all these modes, independent of everything else going on, which would describe more states than the system naturally has. Right, right. Or no. if instead you're just restricting your attention to states among the Hilbert space these of the system. O tilde modes will, will, will be state dependent in a, in a specific way. You can't define these O tilde modes about the vacuum, for example. You will not be able to. Uh, j just let me, let me say a little more about these, these operators. And uh, right now I'm just saying you need such modes. You need modes that commute with the original modes. Whether they exist or not is, is something I'm going to spend a lot of time discussing. Okay, one more quick qu question. Yes. Are you, you're still at infinite n because you're talking about a sharp horizon? Uh, I'm still at, at large n, yes. I'm still talking about a, a perturbative one man expansion. Uh, if you like, I can, I mean, the picture here is just that, you know, you have, let's say you, you did have some eternal black hole. So this, was, this is region one where you're operating, and this is region two. Now, this, this region here has modes that come in from this side, but also has some modes that look like they came from this side. Right, so either you're talking about modes that are coming from, from the left, which were actually naturally formed in the collapse process. One they, way or these are naturally formed in the collapse process. So you, the idea is that you take a collapsing geometry, and at late times, so if you look in a, at an observer who jumps in late enough, you can replace it with this eternal geometry. And so if you probe this geometry late enough in the collapsing period, it nevertheless still has those modes. You can't entirely forget about the collapse. There are some modes that are right-moving modes that right. look like they came right. from there the There are some state naturally formed states of the system that have those modes. That's right. Propagate. That's right. Yes. And there's, there's no information in these modes about the collapse, but those modes exist. You can't define a local quantum field without without looking at these right moving modes. I mean, the information is, is very weak. There's not, there's not much. So, so if I understand correctly what you're saying, uh, so there were the modes omega k, which yes. uh, were modes that correspond yes. to the left, the yes. right CFT. Yes. 
And then you say, in a, if you start from microstate, yeah, yeah. I can form I can form the omega tilde k tilde that look like they are on the left CFT. Uh, uh, so you, you you want to really reconstruct region three? No, I don't really want to reconstruct region three. I want to reconstruct the late time behavior of region. No, I understand three. that. That's what we want to reconstruct. But yeah. this. It uh, sounds like you're reconstructing right, okay. more than we So if I, if, I, if I try to, to take these modes that and the late time of region 2 and extend them back to region 3, I'd have to go through some very high energy physics. So I don't think you can, you know, you can take the modes which I think are well defined here and, and pull them back all the way to get a picture of region 3. Because at some point you'd hit the collapsing matter and then, you know, you expect that you shouldn't be able to evolve them back in time to get region 3. Let me just translate one's question. Is yes. that sum there over all states? In the, is omega, ra omega and K, do they range over all states in the CFT or just some subset? So this is obviously an ill-defined sum because I have to regulate it in some sense. So what I'm saying is that if you want to look at low point correlators of O and low point correlators of O tilde, it effectively looks like you're computing them in such a state. But l I, haven't, I haven't gotten to the, the last bullet point yet. Okay, we'll let you tell us what this yes. is. Yes, okay, good. Yes. Yes, yes. Let, let, let me just say, so I have only one CFT. I should, maybe I should have put in an intermediate thing. I, I, let, 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 me, let me spend some, uh, just give, okay. So the idea is that you have, you have a collapsing geometry, okay, and the collapsing geometry, so there's really some, some you have one CFT and you have, you have some collapse, right, and that you inject matter in and you get some horizon. Okay, so I inject matter in at some point and I have, I have some matter in, this matter goes and forms a singularity. Now, I am a late observer who jumps in here, right? I jump in from the boundary so that I'm much up there. So that I'm much after when the collapse happened. In this region of space-time, the expectation is that you should be able to replace this with some eternal geometry. Okay, so the expectation is that, that, that you, it, it should look like, I'm sorry, I'm coming here, it should look like you have you know, this geometry is effectively, of the collapsing geometry at late times, is effectively the same as the eternal uh, Schwarzschild geometry. And so to construct local operators here, you need, you know, left movers from here, and you also need right movers from the other side. You need two different kinds of modes. In a single CFT, you have to find them in a single CFT to, to get the expectation that, you know, a collapsing geometry looks like an eternal geometry at late times. These modes have to exist. And maybe the modes don't exist, in which case the CFT doesn't describe the interior. So, They, 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 these modes certainly don't exist independently of, of other states. They're going to, they, I'm going to construct them given a, given a certain microstate. I'm going to say there are certain operators that look like they behave in this way. Yes, given a certain reference microstate. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what that means yet, what this distinction means yet, but fine, yes. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask. Yes. So when you say at late times, you yes. mean at any time? Because you're talking about an energy eigenstate, possibly? Well, uh, I, well, no, I'm not, it can't really be an energy eigenstate which wouldn't have evolution. I have to have some spread of energies to have, you know, some non-trivial evolution. If I really had an energy eigenstate, it wouldn't evolve at all. So let me, let me allow, I mean. But uh, I guess before you were, when you were talking about your construction, you were talking about um, really having particular energy, pure Really states. exactly having eigenstates. Okay, maybe you can think of an energy of some, some hypothesis of this kind where you have some operators that, that uh, okay, I don't know how to think about that. I don't no, know how to I think about, about a spread just, that's so small that it's, it, you know, even if you take a state that's e to the minus n square by 2, a spread of that size, mm -hmm. that's enough to take a lot of microstates. It has some, it has, you know, it has some evolution. But if you really take an energy eigenstate, it, it really looks like it doesn't evolve. So I don't know exactly. But I guess I'm just that. asking, going forward, are you yes. going to, are you going to claim to construct um, something behind the horizon of an energy eigenstate? If you try, if you, if you apply your construction to uh, that case. So the fact that it's an energy eigenstate will not be important to me, and maybe you can think of an energy eigenstate as, in some sense, having this kind of dynamics. But I will not talk about energy eigenstates. Let me always talk about a spread of energies that's large enough to contain many eigenstates, which can be much smaller than order one. Okay. But is that going to come into your construction? No. Okay. No. That's not so no matter how long you wait after the collapse, yes. there will still be some observables which will distinguish between the collapse. Those observables the are very fine-tuned. You know, if you think perturbatively of somebody who's jumping in here, you can think of this in Kruskal coordinates. You draw the singularity here. And if you think of how hard it is to send a signal to somebody who jumps in very late, Somebody who jumps in early has to co collimate this signal really, really tightly to make sure the signal reaches the late observer. So if you have a late observer who jumps in and an early observer who jumps in, for the early observer, it gets harder and harder to send signals to a late observer. In fact, it gets exponentially harder. So eventually, I'm going to stop bothering about what signals this person has. Of course, there is some information still left because the CFT is unitary. But l let me just continue with, with what I'm saying. This is, this is not something controversial. I'm just saying that semi-classically, this is what you expect. 
I'm not saying anything new or controversial here. Well, I think one thing that is controversial is the existence of the left side. This so side, I'm not going to no, claim is going to exist. That, that side, yeah. This side, I'm not, I'm not going to say this side is going to exist. I'm going to try and reconstruct the operators here. Okay. If you translate these operators back in time, I claim that you have to go through some transplankian physics, which is when you hit the horizon. So you can't really reconstruct some region 3. I don't think you'll see it at this infinite order in N, but I think you couldn't really reconstruct region 3. Let's see the way to see Here's what? Right yes. And he has a microphone. Okay. <laughs> So yes. just to clarify, yes. and that's related to what has just been said, if you look at this just in free field theory, those are modes that go back, become ultraplanky, and bounce off the horizon and come back out in the case where you're collapsing. Sorry, oh, sorry bounce off R equals zero, excuse me, and uh -huh. come back out in the case where you don't have the second side. Now, of course, you might worry that they would interact with the infalling matter but if they're in one of these states uh, that is not a generic state of the system, this is related to what Eva was saying, uh, then they're uh, in particular correlated with their outside partners and their cancellation, so they don't really interact with the infalling matter. So I think Juan is asking, why can't I reconstruct region 3? And I'm saying that if well, you try and evolve these operators back, that's the same question as saying, if I have a collapsing geometry in ADS, why can't I take these guys and evolve them back? Yeah, no, I'm not trying to answer Juan's question. Okay. I'm just trying to point out that in the one-sided geometry, okay. at least one way of thinking about these modes. Well, let, me, let me try and... Okay, I, actually, you know, this is really not relevant to what I'm going to say. I want to continue since we have a tight this thing, but so, yes. So, so uh, le le let me just say, you know, this... Uh, let me say more about these operators. This is the first time I've introduced them. I'm going to say a lot about them. So just just, just wait wait for a little while since we have a tight uh, discussion. Okay, good. So, so uh, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to say a lot more about these operators, but it looks from the semi-classical perspective that you need such operators in region 2. And these operators have to be independent of the original modes. And they also have to be correlated with the original modes. And that if I measure O and then I measure O tilde, it looks like these, that, like these results of these, these experiments are correlated. And that's the statement that you want, you, we would like, and I'm going to make this more precise. You want some generic equilibrium state for some observer who's measuring low point correlators of O and O tilde. If an observer just measures a few low point correlators, then this state should look, should look like a direct product state for the purposes of those low point correlators. It should look like 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 the thermal field state. And I'll, I'll, so this is just for the purposes of measuring low point correlators. And I'll make this more precise, okay? Okay, now if you can find such operators, if you can find such operators, whether or not they exist is a, is a separate issue. If you can find such operators, maybe in a given state or maybe generally, uh, then you can construct local operators behind the horizon. You construct local operators behind the horizon by basically taking modes on the right side and analytically continuing them through. And then you have some other mode operators that you can find explicitly. Uh, you have some other mode functions so that you can construct local operators uh, behind, behind the horizon in this way. So I think the issue, the really the issue of whether or not you can describe the interior of a black hole in ADS-CFT is an issue of whether or not in some sense, and I'll try and talk about what sense, whether or not in some sense you can find such operators. So this is what I'd like to phrase the issue of describing the interior of the CFT in terms of. Is it's a question of whether you can find these operators that approximately commute with these, with these given operators and, and, and can be correlated in a given state. And if you argue that you can't find such operators, then I think it's very hard to construct perturbative local fields behind the horizon, and then you can't describe the interior. So I think this is a sharp phrasing of the question of whether or not you can describe the interior of the black hole in the CFT. Okay. Yes. Um, can I just, yes. Let, let me just go on and say more about these operators, and then you, you can ask me questions about this, since I'm always already halfway through my time. Okay, now I want to say that if you could find such a construction, and again, I, I, want to, I want to underline the if. I know many of you might be skeptical about whether such a construction exists, so we can come to that in some time. Uh, but if you can find such a construction, then these O and A O tilde operators are obviously an overcomplete basis for the same Hilbert space. Right? They, if you can find such a construction for an old black hole, then they're an overcomplete basis for the same Hilbert space. And so you resolve this strong subadditivity puzzle in a, in a pretty natural way. Because you know these three subsystems that, that Joe and others have been, that Joe and Don and, uh, and uh, the AMPSS have been talking about, are, are uh, you know are rely on this assumption that the degrees of freedom far away and the degrees of freedom behind the horizon and the degrees of freedom close to the horizon just outside it are all independent. But if really the construction is in terms of operators acting in a single Hilbert space, and you don't have this strong subadditivity puzzle. And I think that such a construction also evades uh, some East theorem about small corrections. I'll talk about this later. I have a separate slide about this. This is just an advertisement uh, on small corrections because I think tacitly this theorem also doesn't allow 
for this possibility of complementarity. And so I, mean, I have a slide in this, so we can talk about this more then. And uh, I think there are also many recent arguments in favor of firewalls that AMPSS and, and uh, uh, Marolf and Polchinski have given. And I think that a lot of these arguments are very naturally evaded if you allow the operators uh, to be state dependent. And I think really that, that, that this proposal is, is very strong for, for precisely many of the recent arguments that AMPSS have given, as I'm going to try and describe in my remaining 30 minutes. Let me first uh, you know, try and describe the following issue. It's about whether you can ensure that these, these O tilde operators, whether they can live in the same space as these O operators that I've been talking about. So the O operators are well-defined operators, right? They're the Fourier modes of some generalized free field. And whether these O tilde operators can live in the same space, and if they can have a small commutator with the original operators. Okay? This is the question, really, of whether somebody who's living outside makes some measurement. When he makes a measurement, he measures an O operator and somebody inside measures an O tilde operator. I'm going to give you an explicit construction so you can make this more precise. And the question is whether the, the measurement that, that's performed by the person outside or by the person inside screws up the experience of the other person. Okay, this is, this is the question. And I think this question can be phrased in terms of whether you can define these operators acting in the same Hilbert space and having uh, you know, a small commutator. And really, in the end, you'd like to describe them in the Hilbert space of n equal to four super angles. So maybe I could just ask my question at this point yes. just to okay. clarify. Yes. I, mean, I think when you talk abstractly in terms of operators, then somehow where things are located gets a little uh, mm -hmm. pushed to the background. Mm -hmm. I just want to emphasize that when you do this, uh, I think if you want to avoid all the small corrections issues as we've discussed before, yes. you will actually need to involve the idea that things which have left the black hole and gone very far away, like 10 to the 77 miles away, yes. they can still be altered because of effects coming from the black hole. Yes, probably. Though by a small amount. Yes, you I will just have want to mention that that That's will, absolutely yeah. true. You when will you end up having bits, to have non-locality. Even the bits which have left, this is a massive non-locality. Sure. Not just over three kilometers, but over uh, all the way to the guides which have left. Yes, it's a question of what the degree of that non-locality is. If you can make that degree e to the minus 10 to the 77, that's acceptable. But I will talk explicitly about that non-locality uh, towards the end of my talk. Yeah, so yes, it's non-local, it's non -local, uh, and I, I think it's an acceptable degree of non-locality. Okay, uh, but let me just try and describe this commutator counter-argument, which I think was at least one of the counter-arguments that AMPSS made, maybe not, or maybe phrased exactly in this language. So this counter-argument goes as follows. Now, let's say you take a large Hilbert space without saying anything about what this Hilbert space is. Let's take a spin chain, okay? And let's take some basis of operators. Let's take the spin operators of a spin chain doesn't even have to be a complete basis. You just take the individual spin operators of the spin chain. And now, well, I'm saying there are these O tilde operators. So these O tilde operators which act in the same Hilbert space. So maybe, you know, you take some, there's some scrambling of the original operators because, you know, you know they have to satisfy, they have to look similar. So they have to satisfy some similar kind of algebra. So you take some operators in a large Hilbert space, you scramble it with some generic unitary matrix. Okay, so this is not a statement about whether or not you can find a good scrambling, but let's say you scramble it with some generic unitary matrix, and you can compute, and you know, typically what this commutator is, and this is not such a hard estimate to make, and typically this commutator has order one eigenvalues. This is for a very generic kind of kind of Hilbert space. You 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 know you you take. It's, it's basically a statement about random matrices. I take a random matrix and a random unitary, and I get this. I just have a. I just want to make a quick question yes. slash comment. I'm very uh, worried about genericity arguments when it comes to these field theories, which are very special. And maybe I'm off base in asking this. You mean the spin chain you're worried about? I'm going to say the spin chain is a bad example too, but but <laughs> but. Uh, well, I but just worry that the, the field theories that have gravity duals are very very special. I'm very ha I'm very and sympathetic to like that the, idea. Things like the commutator you're talking about have a lot to do with the, the thing that's Excellent. special. Excellent. I'm, I'm very sympathetic yeah. to that idea that this is a bad argument because precisely because this is a bad example, as I'm going to say in in my next slide. Uh, yes. It's really just a question. Yes, no, no, I, 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 I agree with you. I agree that, that in general you shouldn't be making arguments at this level of generality. I agree. Yes. I'm going to make an argument that's not going to talk about strongly coupled theories, but that might be slightly less general than this, maybe. Uh, just, just give me a second. Okay, but this is, this is the, the general argument. This is the, the generic estimators that you make. You know, you take a random uh, operator, you scramble it with a random unitary matrix, and you get a large commutator. Is this a fair statement of one of the... Okay, good. So this is, this is an argument saying, oh, you make a measurement outside and things happen. Okay, now we'd like to see if these arguments hold true in a more realistic case, not as realistic as the kind of thing that, that Eva is talking about, uh, but slightly more realistic. So let's say you imagine you know, a black hole as being some system that couples to some radiation field that lives outside. Okay. Now, uh, really, when, if, you had, you know, if, you had, if you really had a lot of microstates of the black hole, then one thing you could say is, oh, these O operators act in this radiation field that lives outside the black hole. 
And these O tilde operators act on these, these microstates. There's some very heavy operators that act on the microstates that I can select in a given way. And so they commute with your operator. So they, you know, if the radiation field outside doesn't really cover half of the Hilbert space, and I have lots of degrees of freedom in my Hilbert space, then I might be able to, at least for, a, for a, say, a very big black hole in ADS, or for a very young black hole, I might be able to find these operators that exist in the CFT that act on the microstates of, of, of the black hole. Okay? Now, the real puzzle is to find these operators when most of the energy is in the radiation field, which is for an old black hole. So let's say you have a really old black hole when most of the energy is now living in the radiation field, and there isn't so much energy living in some hidden degrees of freedom or hidden microstate degrees of freedom. And that's really where a lot of these, these puzzles for firewalls are based. They're based on the system where you know, the system has radiated most of its energy into the radiation field, and then O and O tilde are both acting in the same Hilbert space. And they're both acting in a Hilbert space that looks tractable. It looks like the Hilbert space of a gas of photons living in ADS. So it looks like something you should be able to analyze using effective field theory. So I think this is where, where the puzzle, uh, puzzle really lies. Now, so let, let, me, let me now try and, try, and, try and now forget about the system that was coupled to the radiation field and just think of this one-dimensional gas of photons, photons and gravitons and whatever else, that's living in a very long box which has some length. Its length is controlled by, this is really a, a, the page size of a, of a big black hole. So it's a very long, block, a very long box and which is given by, you know, it's, it's a box which is the size of the page radius of some very massive black hole. Okay? Now, of course, the frequencies of the photons that can live in this box are quantized. They're quantized in, in terms of the inverse length of this, of, this, of this box. And now, let's say you put some energy m inside this box. So you have a gas of photons which has this energy m that lives in this, very, in this you know, page size box, which is a very big box. Okay? Now, actually, you know, funnily, you can, you can think of this as the Hawking gas of S waves that's emitted by an old black hole. So you have some old black hole that emits some S waves. And you know, these S waves don't go out further than the page time in, this, in the page time. And uh, you can actually compute the entropy of this. this. is just a one plus one dimensional gas. You can compute the entropy using Cardi's formula. The entropy works out right. It worked out right because I put some fudge factors here, of course. But it, the, the order of magnitude, magnitude comes out correctly, and that's, that's just something I'm using. And I don't want to make a big deal about it. It might be 40% higher than the entropy or whatever the, the estimates for the entropy of the Hawking gas are. Okay, here I made it come out exactly right by putting the right factors of 2 by 3 and 3 by 2. OK, good. So now the natural observables in this, in this radiation thing are these field observables. You can, what, what can you naturally measure? You can't measure all operators in, 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 in this radiation field. I'm going to claim that what you can naturally measure are the field operators. And the field has some expansion in terms of creation and hilation operators. And then there's some, you know, there's some left moving things which I'm not going to write down. And then, of course, the Hermitian conjugate of this expansion. But the point is you have some modes of the field, but you can't measure these modes individually. Okay, these modes means you take n times and there should be a factor of i here, n times the omega ir frequency. And what I'm interested in are correlators of this radiation field where the number of points that I insert into the correlator does not scale with n. So I don't want to consider some very high point correlator. I'm not going to say that a semi-classical geometry makes sense for such a high point correlator. I'm going to say that I want to consider a low point correlator. And these are the natural observables, not, not, not these individual creation hilation operators, but the field observables. OK, good. Now. Uh, let's say you consider an, uh, an operator who has limited resolving power. So you have an observer who can't distinguish you know, these very long frequencies, as indeed a real observer couldn't. Okay? So he can't distinguish the frequency you know, p times omega ir from the frequency p plus 1 times omega ir, because these frequencies are both very low frequency. Omega ir is a very low frequency. So this operator who makes, you know, who makes uh, some local measurements of the field and has some apparatus with limited resolving power can't distinguish these individual, these individual frequencies. Okay? So based on this intuition, I'll try and make this more precise in the, in the coming slides, you can say that, well, what this guy with really limited resolving power measures is some linear combination of these individual creation hilation operators. He can't measure the individual creation hilation operators. He measures some coarse grain version of these creation hilation operators, which is some sum of these. You can come up with other models of how to, how to model and observe with this guy, but this is just one, and I, I'll try and, I'll try and uh, develop this one. And then there's, of course, an orthogonal transform. So you can come up with other, so you know, if you just had two different, two very closely spaced frequencies, there's the creation operator for A1 plus A2, and there's the, the, the transverse to that, which is A1 minus A2. And I'm going to say this coarse grain observer can basically measure A1 plus A2 and can't measure A1 minus A2. And the only thing about these chi-j coefficients is that they have this property so that, you know, the beta oscillators are orthogonal to the alpha oscillators. Okay, so this is just a definition so far. Good. 
Okay, so, so the physical idea, as I said, is that the course observer effectively sees the space of excitations. I'm not going to put this in the end. In the end, I'm going to let the observer measure the real field. But the physical intuition, the physical intuition is that the course observer sees effectively the space of excitations of the alpha p. But there are lots of fine-grained degrees of freedom in these beta p oscillators, in these a1 minus a2 oscillators, that it's hard for him to access. So these are what I'm going to call the fine-grained degrees of freedom. And based on this division, I'm going to divide the Hilbert space into you know, some core space, which are the excitations of these alpha p oscillators. So always think of alpha p as a sum of you know, creation oscillators for nearby frequencies, and the beta p oscillators, which are like the differences of creation oscillators for these frequencies. Okay? And obviously, you know, uh, while I divided the Hilbert space into a direct product, if you restrict the total energy, then not all states in this direct product are allowed. You are restricted to particular entangled states where you have some energy E here, or you know, some energy M here, and some energy E minus M in the space. So there's some particular entangled space. If you like, you can think of that as a vibration, but it's more convenient just to think of a direct product state and thinking of you know, entangled states that can live in this direct product space. OK. Now, any state in the CFT can be written in this form. You can take any state of this energy E, and you can expand it in terms of some coarse and fine, in terms of some coarse and fine states. Of course, as I said, these coefficients have to be restricted by the fact if I restrict the total energy. And you can take these, these alpha ij matrices, and you can perform a singular value decomposition, which means this is a rectangular matrix because there are more degrees of freedom in the fine space than there are in the coarse space. And I can diagonalize this rectangular matrix in this way. Okay? And once, yes? Can you repeat that? The course in fine grain right now is just a definition. I'm going to say more yes, about it Yes, but what's later. the definition? The definition is the following, that, that I, I take my oscillators, which were my original oscillators for different frequencies. OK, these, MP these creates enumerate the, frequency. the frequencies in a box, is yes, that correct? Yes, I enumerate the frequencies in a box. Right. And so I have some discrete number of frequencies. Right. Now I take some neighboring frequencies, and I sum up those neighboring creation too close. Neighboring too close okay, frequencies, good. like uh, adjacent frequencies. Okay. And I sum up those operators, and I call yes. that my course grained operators, and these are my fine grain operators, which are the differences of those guys. Well, let's see. I mean, it's... Um, if you In the end, I'll, I'll let you measure the real field. This is just a crutch for my construction. Yeah. Um, I understand where you're trying to go. You're yes. trying to define very, very slow things and fast things, but okay. I don't... Uh, it's not obvious to me that, uh, that this decomposition makes sense. You begin with n degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like you have 2n or? Uh, no, I didn't have 2n. I still well, have. Th this, has, this has a smaller number of degrees of freedom. The number of coarse degrees of freedom is smaller than the full space. You can't access all the degrees of freedom. How either. many coarse grained are there? I beg your pardon? How many coarse grained? Well, it depends on what you take to be m. But roughly, you could. M, you, if, m, I mean, m is something that controls how many, how many frequencies oh, you I bunch see, together. Okay. But let's say you bunch together two frequencies, and roughly half the degrees of freedom are coarse grained. Half the degrees of freedom. If you bunch space. together two, two frequencies, then, then the coarse grain space has a size that's roughly the square root of the size of the full space. You have to do this estimate more carefully, which, which I could discuss. Now. OK, I see. I don't want to delay you, but you would think the coarse grain observer could see the sums of the squares of the A's, which you he can Well, uh, in the end, I'm going to let you measure the real field. I'm going to define some tilde field, and I'll let you measure the real field. Okay, so not, not just so you can measure whatever you like with the real field. OK, okay good. So now, you know, you're, you, after I've done this diagonalization, there's some particular coarse grain space. These are now also normal vectors that's entangled with something in the fine grain space. And, you know, these matrices alpha p, by definition, they act in the coarse grain space. Actually, you have to edge modify them to make sure they don't take you out of this, this set of, you know, states of energy E. And you can define some mirror operators that act in exactly the dual way on the fine grain space. And these mirror operators are defined with respect to the original state because these hatted operators depend on what the original state was. So these mirror operators are defined with respect to the entanglement. So they're operators that are defined by the entanglement for now. Okay? So I can just define these operators based on this. So you give me a state in the CFT. Uh, these alpha p operators are well defined initially. And I'm going to define these mirror operators that are defined by the entanglement of the course with a fine degrees of freedom. Okay? Good. So and using these mirror operators, I can construct a mirrored field. This mirrored field obviously is not exactly local. I mean, even the original field had non-locality over very large distances. This mirror field has non-locality over slightly smaller distances, but still over large distances. It doesn't have as many modes as the original field did. But now the point is that this mirrored field as defined by these mirror operators commutes almost exactly with the original field. So now I'm not, the coarse, the coarse field is gone. I don't want to talk about the coarse field except as an intermediate construction. So I measure a correlator of this kind, which is, you know, some points outside and say this point is inside. Okay, so I measure a correlator of, of this kind. You can see that the real field is actually pretty close to the coarse field up to terms of this order. 
Okay, so the real field, which has the original modes oscillators, is actually pretty close to this coarse field I defined that had only the coarse oscillators. Okay? And so this commutator is actually pretty close to the commutator of the coarse field and this fine field that I defined. And this commutator is zero by construction because these two guys act in totally different Hilbert spaces. So the real commutator of the original field with the, with the fine field is suppressed by some factor of s. It's suppressed by s to the 3 by 2 into the distance that you have here, into a distance over which you measure the commutator. In fact, with a little more work, you can argue that in a correlator of this kind, you can't really measure a single commutator. The reason you can't measure a single commutator is because I, while I did say that generic commutators had eigenvalues of order 1, you know, they also generically have matrix elements that are exponentially small. So if you just sandwich this commutator in the middle of two states, you generically will get expectation values that are very small. So what you can really measure is actually the square of the commutator. So the smallest non-local effect you detect in this model, in this particular model, is suppressed by 1 over s cubed, where s is the entropy of this gas that I talked about. Okay. And smallest effect meaning I'm going to define for you this other operator that acts in the same space, and I measure commutators of this kind. Okay. And this is, this is, so the coarse field was an intermediate, was a crutch I used to construct this fine field, and I get these commutators. Yes. Go on. Yes. Since you've written this as an expectation value, this is the expectation value in the original state you had, or this in, is an in, arbitrary in, state? In, in, in the original state I had. In the original state I had, yes. Yeah, I just want to bring up the issue that maybe people are worried about at the start of the talk. So these operators are defined using the help of a state. Yes. So I get a little bit confused about the meaning of the operator, because an operator normally I think of as a matrix which can act in a linear span of yes. states. But that's not how I can this think is, about it. This is a very this, sparse right? operator. I'm going to come to that in a minute. This is a very sparse operator. Let, let me just say a little more about this operator, since I have only 10 minutes left. So the first, there, there are several arguments, other arguments about the construction of these operators. For example, one of them is there's no left inverse. And I'm, I'm answering that in a minute, Samir. Uh, so, so you know, this provides, so first of all, the, the thing is that I think this provides some explicit example where there are you know, small violations of locality and, and there are small corrections to semi-classical correlators. But there are many other arguments for why the interior can't exist, not just the commutator argument. For example, one of the arguments that was given by AMPSS was that the interior operator has to lower the energy. The interior operator, you look at the creation operator for a mode inside, the creation operator, not, not the annihilation operator, and this creation operator lowers the energy. Okay? But it also has a left inverse. It has a left inverse because you expect it to satisfy the right algebra. But there's no such operator in the field theory that maps the Hilbert space of energy E to the Hilbert space of energy E minus omega. But I just gave you some explicit construction. So what is the contradiction? Why is it that, that this argument doesn't go through? Reason the argument doesn't go through, let me give you a toy model just to think about this. And I think this comes to your question, Samir. Uh, let, me, let me forget about the radiation field just to help you think about these operators. Let's say I had a very simple subsystem and I defined this to be my core space, you know, just 0 and 1, a two-state a two system. And I had a fine space which had one state with energy 0 and n states with energy 1. Now I consider some total, some state which has total energy 1, where the vacuum is entangled with some linear combination of the energetic states and the fine state. And the energetic state in the coarse grain guys entangled with the fine vacuum. In the mirror of this operator, which takes you know, the zero state in the coarse grain state to the one state, is actually something that takes you know, a certain combination, uh, not all fine states, but a certain linear combination of fine grain states to the vacuum of the fine grain guy. So the picture is that really it's a sparse operator. So these state dependent operators that are defined are sparse operators. They don't click on generic states in, in, in the system. Okay? So they map some subset of the Hilbert space of energy E to some subset, the corresponding subset of the Hilbert space of energy E minus omega. And these subsets are defined by the state you're talking about. And so there's no contradiction with linear algebra. They had another argument, which was, well, why can't we use the union of all constructions to get a contradiction? This was the second argument in the paper. Let's say you try to do that. So you took one state which gave you some subset, a mapping of this kind. Now you said, let me take another state which gives you a mapping of a different kind. Generally, what will happen is that the, the images of these maps will actually collide in the smaller subspace. And you can check this explicitly. So the explicit construction shows that if you try and cover this larger Hilbert space with a sequence of maps by constructing some sequence of states that have disjoint you know, images in this, in this larger Hilbert space, typically what happens is that you overcover the lower state, which is exactly what you'd expect. So there's no contradiction either by, with linear algebra or with this union of all constructions argument. In this, in this kind of construction. Good. Yes? Haven't you, just, haven't you just shown that you can't consistently define this operator in a typical state? Well, you can define this operator in a, in, in a certain, for a certain typical state. It, it takes some particular map, uh, you know, it takes 
for a given state, it takes this subset in HE to something here. It right. doesn't act on, I mean, for most guys in HE, it just gives you zero with some reasonable definition of most. But I'm confused. It's not something that has a left inverse. Well, it I'm maps confused. a small, it's a sparse operator. But then you didn't reconstruct. I beg your pardon? It means this, for example. It maps, it maps some linear combination of the energetic states to something here. So it, you know, it, it's, it's sparse in this space. I thought we agreed at the beginning of your talk that what we would like to have, although it's difficult to find, is an operator that acts like phi or a dagger on all states. No, no, this operator doesn't act like a dagger on all states. I never said I'll find an operator that acts like a dagger on all states. Then you have not, then you haven't constructed the local fields in typical states. I have, I have constructed, you give me a typical state and I'm telling you which operator inside acts the correct way. So the integral transform I have depends on which state I'm in. So that's why it's state dependent. So, so that you are claiming that there is no universal operator no matter how hard we might Well, I have not been able to find such a universal operator. I'm not claiming there's no... You prove it, it doesn't exist. Well, I'm, oh, fine. So then there's no universal operator, if you like, but I'm not concerned with the existence of... So I don't want to find such a universal operator. I mean, I'm happy with, with state-dependent maps that work in a given background, or that work for a given microstate. Uh, so I, I, I... Now, whether or not... I whether or not move to a stronger version of state dependence than you express in your initial slide. Yes, yes, yes. It is, it is, it is, it is a what slightly is stronger it? version in that it depends on the details of the microstate. Yes. Yes. A much it, stronger. Yes, it is, it is a stronger version, but I want to say that this state dependence doesn't violate quantum mechanics uh, per se. Can I just go through this in five minutes, and then we, 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 will, we, will, we will talk, talk about this? Good. So, so, so uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's another argument, which is, uh, which is the most recent Maros Polchinsky argument, which is, well, let's say NB is something that measures the occupation number of some B mode, which is some mode outside the horizon. And they say, well, if NB tilde, which is what measures the occupation number of its partner inside the horizon, if it's some fixed operator in the CFT, if it's a fixed operator, and you take a CFT state of a given energy, then the CFT state doesn't look like, you know, this fixed operator has the same expectation value as this operator, as, as, as the original operator outside the horizon. And so this operator has some non-zero expectation value for NA, where NA is a mode seen by the observer who falls through the horizon. Okay, but this argument does depend, does rely on the assumption that the operator inside the horizon is some fixed operator that's the same for all states in the CFT. Okay? And, and the way they said it was you compute the microcanonical expectation value of NA, you compute this not in the energy basis, but by going to the NB basis. And generically, you expect this to be non-zero because the generic state doesn't have the same value for NB tilde as it does for NB. Now, what's the contradiction with this explicit construction that again does give you NA equal to zero? So the contradiction is that the NA, this operator NA, it depends. Okay, so this is just a statement that the NA operator depends on both the exterior and the interior operators. But when you take this expectation value and you vary over states, this operator inside the definition, the precise definition, varies as you change psi. And in fact, the way we constructed it, for a generic state, you take a generic state, and the way we defined our operator NB tilde, is that in fact it does look like this thermal field double state. The value of NB tilde is correlated with the value of NB. So in fact, I think that this argument that, that you guys gave, I think that that's a very strong argument in favor of state dependence for the interior operators. In fact, you know, we tried some, some, some t you know, for some time to try and find uh, operators inside that were not state dependent. And I think this is a very strong argument that the operators inside have to be state dependent. But I hope it's clear that for such operators, the original argument doesn't go through because as you take this expectation value, as you're weighting down the ensemble, the operator you're looking at is changing. And in fact, in this construction, the expectation value is very small. It's exponentially small. Okay, so the last set of arguments I have to deal with. There is frozen uh, vacuum arguments, which actually uh, made by Busso, but I think Marx arguments, I think, fall into the same category. The argument is as follows. You said, I said, that, you know, the operators inside were defined by entanglement. Very good. But let's say I have some, some observer who goes and does some experiments, who, you know, excites the vacuum. If my interior operator is always chosen by entanglement, if it's always chosen by entanglement, then I can never excite the horizon. Even if I have some observer who goes there and who actually, you know, excites the, va the horizon by doing something, if the interior operator is always chosen to be the operator that's, you know, defined by entanglement, then the vacuum will be frozen. Okay? But I think the rule is, even though I, I, I defined it in this case by entanglement, what we would like the rule to be is not that the interior operator is, is chosen to be the one that's entangled with the exterior operator, but that the interior operator is chosen to be the one that gives us perturbative local fields. And it is true that for a generic equilibrium state, for a generic equilibrium state, which doesn't involve some excitation, somebody going near the horizon and making excitations, these two rules are the same thing. Okay, the rule of, of what gives you, let me complete and we'll have questions in two minutes. What, what gives us, what gives us you know, uh, the operators inside is indeed that which is defined by entanglement. I can even tell you what the rule is for a state of this kind. 
okay if you had a slightly out of equilibrium state which is not a generic state then I can tell you that I can tell you what the correct rule is the correct rule is that you take define the operators with respect to psi and then this person goes and does some excitations near the horizon but you don't change the O tilde operators you keep them the same and this kind of or this this rule will give you the correct will give you the correct prescription even for these non generic states uh, that that uh, uh, Busso and I think uh, Mark in a different language have talked about which are non generic states and this kind of rule where you don't change the O tilde operators when you make such an excitation uh, would give us the right rule now it would be nice to really translate what I said that these are the unique operators that give us local fields into into something that reduces to this rule in this case and the other rule in the other case okay we don't have some some way some way you know some real way of doing the one over an expansion and showing this but I think that these rules are right because these local operators we do get by means of this rule you know the operators which have the correct local behavior for which the vacuum is not frozen so I think if you were to try and work at the one over an expansion or if you find some other way of constraining this this construction of local operators better uh, you would find this answer I just have a couple of slides and then, then we can have questions okay good uh, small corrections um, one one last thing about small corrections so the small corrections argument and we can talk more uh, there's a theorem which says that well you you have uh, you, you know how did we get even a unitary model that had only small corrections and uh, Samir had, an, had a theorem in 2009 which uh, he's expanded on since which says well you know look at the wave function of the full wave function evolves by something you know happening to the wave function inside and the creation of this bell pair and then you get the creation of another bell pair right so you just create these many bell pairs and you can't correct the system of bell pairs in some way to get you know to get uh, 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 some some unitary state something which has which has full Neumann entropy zero the difference here is that these b1 b2 c2 and c1 are not all independent excitations okay they're excitations of the same collective modes and this is something that's tacitly assumed in the theorem and so this is what allows us to evade uh, Samir's theorem okay. okay so I think I dealt with all 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 the counter arguments maybe people are not entirely happy with with some of the answers but I think I, I dealt with them and let me just summarize and then I'll I'll stop uh, so I said we wanted to reorganize boundary correlators in terms of perturbative fields what reorganization we do depends on the state that we have but at leading order in one by n we can give you some rules in some cases the rules might even appear ad hoc uh, but but they describe both the interior and exterior of a black hole and these operators as we discussed at length are state dependent okay and at leading order it looks like the exterior operators depend only on the energy although as I said there are some cases where they depend on more and the interior operators have stronger state dependence clearly but nevertheless if you grant this this seems to resolve several arguments okay there's a bunch of uh, open questions which I'll just describe the open questions are basically to prove that these rules that look somewhat ad hoc from this perspective are really justified that this is the unique construction of perturbative fields if you include the one over an expansion and I think the other major open question is to try and understand a bulk interpretation of what these non-local corrections are as Samir pointed out correctly you know this does give you non-local non-local effects over large distances um, I should also say that in the model I presented these non-local effects were power loss suppressed they weren't exponentially suppressed and you could ask why can't I construct a model where these effects non-local effects are exponentially suppressed the problem is if you try and do that typically you make the length of the, the lifetime of the black hole too large that being said I should say that that even for operators outside the black hole we don't understand locality very well because the metric at infinity can measure the energy inside so you know as, as Don has pointed out there's a commutator of the metric at infinity with some interior operator which is already 1 over n so we need to understand what operators you need to impose exact locality for and we already have something that gives us the same kind of commutator for things inside but we need to understand how to make this exponential and I think the main thing which many people have asked me is you know what is the bulk interpretation of these corrections okay I'll stop thank you I'm sorry, but we must move on to Yasunori. Everyone will have plenty of time at 3.30 to respond. If you just can't wait, do what I'm doing. Post your remarks to the wiki. Okay, great. <laughs>